Hey guys, welcome to Reality Churches from the Vault. This is our midweek service where we play a previously recorded sermon, but we interact with you live. And so thank you for being here and making it a priority. This month, we are replaying one of our favorite sermon series of all time called The Dark. Life is not always sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. Sometimes our experiences are painful. Sometimes they lead to thoughts of depression, anxiety, maybe even thoughts of suicide. And so we want to be able to offer you guys hope during this bizarre time that we are living in right now. So interact with us and enjoy the sermon. Well, good morning, 1045 service. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, enjoying this great weather we're having. It rained a lot, didn't it? Yeah. My name is Robert Kahn. I'm on staff here at Reality Church, and we just want to welcome you. Thanks for being here today. You picked a great day to be here. We're actually wrapping up our series that we've been in the last few weeks called The Dark, and we're going to wrap it up in kind of a unique way, at least for us. We're going to do something that we haven't done before. We're going to have an extended Q&A session. And so uh, if you you are familiar with us, you know that at the end of the sermons, you can text in questions, uh, either through text app or through our mobile app that we have. Um, But anyway, so we're going to have uh, on stage a panel of people, people from the videos that you've been seeing in the dark sermon series. And so uh, we have Wyatt and we have Kathy and we have Daniil. They're going to be up here. And so if you have a question specific for them, you can be able to text that in. And so uh, I will say this, this is our live service. So we want to welcome everyone who's watching live. Uh, Some of the questions that uh, because this service is live, they may not be able to uh, answer them, particularly Daniil. She may not be able to answer some of those questions. So she wants you to know that if, if one of those is asked, she is available afterwards. But just for security reasons, we don't know who's watching. We need to protect uh, everyone involved. And so uh, we're going to do that in a little bit. And so go ahead and start thinking about those questions for the panelists, or even if you have just general questions about faith and darkness and the stuff we've been talking about over the last few weeks. And so um, w- when we started off the series, we had to define what the dark was. And here's how we defined it. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> dark. There we go. Okay. So we define the dark as those times in life when our suffering is combined with the silence of God. And so I, I have to believe that with a crowd this size, that many of you, if not all of you, understand what I'm talking about. Those times in life when, when you are going through something, suffering, you would call it suffering, and maybe you are a believer, or maybe you, you believe in God, or the concept of God, and you cried out, and you were met with seemingly silence. He didn't come in and rescue you from the situation. He didn't take it away. He didn't alleviate whatever pressure you were under. Your prayer seemed to hit the ceiling, right? Like those times in life when we go through suffering and we're met with the silence of God or what seems like that, that's the dark. And so we, we started this series about four weeks ago, and, and we weren't real sure how this was going to, to end up, honestly. I wasn't. I thought, man, we're going to spend four weeks talking about some really heavy, dark stuff. And is that okay with everybody? Like, are they going to be able to track with that? Do we need to throw in like some, you know, bounce houses and celebrations in there at some point? But honestly, guys, we have gotten some of the best feedback from this sermon series that we've ever gotten. And I think that's because people resonate more almost than anything with going through times in life that are difficult and that are dark. And and people are understanding it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to to, to open up to others and share what I'm going through. And I think that's why we've gotten such a great response. And so week one, we, we learned the concept of lament and what lamenting for a believer is. And, and we learned that most of the Psalms in the Bible are songs of lament, crying out to God. There's a whole book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. It's about lament and how as believers, lament is not something we do in preparation of worship. It is worship. It's those times when we come to God and we say, God, here's my situation. 
Here's what I'm going through. I don't understand it. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm going through it. I don't know why you would want me to go through it. I don't know what I'm supposed to learn from going through it. I don't know any of that. But I know you. And I trust you. And I trust that since you created the universe that you might be a little bit more intelligent than I am. And so I trust that somehow, in some way, you're going to make sense of this in some time, whether it be on, on this side of heaven or on the other side. I don't know, but I'm trusting and I'm giving you all of my insecurity and my doubt and my fear and my loneliness and all of those things. And then week two, we talked about how in the dark, God is not watching us from afar. He's not sitting up in the stands going, I hope you make it. No, he's not watching us. He's with us in the dark. And we looked at the life of Jesus and how Jesus himself, being God, suffered. We serve a God who knows suffering and how he, he understands the angst and, the, and what it feels like to go through these dark times in life. And God is not hoping we get through the other side. He is with us. And then last week, last week we talked about how God not only uses the dark to shape us, but he uses our response to shape others. And we looked at the life of Peter and how Peter betrayed Christ. And it, it could have been and, and, and really was for a short period of time his darkest moment. And he had a choice. He could live out the rest of his days just in that, in that horrible reminder that I failed. I failed what God wanted me to do. I failed God. And he could have looked back at that time and thought, man, that was a good time, right? It was a good few years I had in ministry with Jesus. They called me up to the, to the big leagues, and I played well for a few years. But, well, that's over. He could have stayed there, but he didn't. Jesus led him through that and, and, and restored him. And, and we know the rest of the story. At Pentecost, Peter stands up and, and, and says a sermon, basically just what was in his heart. And thousands of people come to faith in Christ. And really, that's why we're here, honestly. And so not only does the dark shape us, but God uses that to shape others as well. And so we've been looking at different psalms throughout the whole dark series. We've looked at several psalms, and I want us to look at one more. I want us to look at Psalm 23, probably the most popular psalm. Seems like everyone has heard this or seen this somewhere. Maybe you heard it at a funeral. Maybe your grandmother has it on a painting in her hallway. You, you've seen it or you saw it on a calendar. You've read it somewhere. Seems like everybody knows this psalm. But I want us to look at it and how it relates to the darkness, how it relates to our journey. Maybe you're there now. Maybe you came today and you didn't have a name for what you're going through. But now you're like, that's it. I'm in the dark. I'm in the darkness. What do I do? So let's take a look at this psalm real quick. Starts off verse 1. We, 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 we know this. We love these promises. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And he restores my soul. We love that. So encouraging. It goes on. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, that's awesome. And then immediately, as if in the same breath, he says this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How many of you, you've heard, you've heard that at some point in your life? That, that verse, right? You heard it, saw it, somebody sang about it, something. We know that. Isn't that a little odd to you, though? That, that, that juxtaposition, that putting two things together that seemingly are so opposite from one another, the paths of righteousness in the valley of the shadow of death, this bothered me. Like, why would he put two things so, so different right there together? And then I realized the reason it was hard for me to understand is I always assumed those were two different roads, I assumed that sometimes God would lead me down these paths of righteousness where I was doing everything well, right? I wasn't perfect, but I was doing what I needed to do to please God. I was reading my Bible. I was praying. He was letting me in on all the stuff that I needed to see and, and all of that, and things were good, the good times. 
Okay, And then sometimes, maybe, I don't know why, but sometimes he would lead me down these valley of the shadow of death moments where maybe you lose someone you love and you pray and that they get healed and they don't get healed and you can't understand why. Or, or maybe you lose a job or, or maybe your, your, your family and your friends, they turn on you. Whatever it is, these moments where you're like, I'm not sure why I'm going through this. I assumed that those were two different paths. And that sometimes I would go down this path and sometimes I would go down this path. Guys, but what if the valley of the shadow of death is the path of righteousness? What if the dark is those moments where our faith is most developed? What if the darkness, the confusion, the heartbreak, where, where we feel like we're drowning in doubt, where, where we don't... Our faith that we have is being overwhelmed. We don't understand anything that we're going on. What if in those moments, God's glory and his grace are most fulfilled in us? What if the valley of the shadow of death is the path of righteousness? And then it goes on. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There again, the promise that God is with us. He's not watching us. He's with us. And we can have comfort in those moments. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Literally, you prepare a feast before me. Like you set the table in, in my enemy's presence. Now, if you can enjoy a feast in the presence of your enemies, that's called peace. We can have peace in these moments. We can have comfort that God is with us, and we can have peace that God prepares and provides for us and then it says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. In other words, you've given me a kingly status that I don't deserve. And everything I have is more than I deserve. You have done everything for me. If, if you stopped doing anything for me today, everything that you have done is already enough. In other words. And then last verse. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Such a strong verse. Such a strong psalm. If you've been here for the three weeks previous studying the, the dark, Lance has been uh, trying to teach everyone a new Hebrew word. And if you sit on the front row, he probably spit on you as he's trying to do it. Somebody want to take a guess what this word is in Hebrew is for our English word mercy. Hesed. hesed or chesed, right? Your goodness and your hesed shall follow me. What is hesed? We talked about how hesed is, is God's grace for us. We defined it as the, the, the person with which I have the right to expect nothing when he in turn gives me everything. That's God's grace. His never ending, never quitting, never giving up on you because of anything you've done. Grace. How God pursues you simply because that's what he does. Not because you deserve pursuing. Not because he's going to get anything in return for pursuing you. He pursues you because he can do no other thing. That's God's hesed. That's God's grace. His goodness and his hesed will follow me. Follow me. What do you mean? That sounds rather passive, like God's trying to keep up, right? Actually, what this word means is chase. Your goodness and your grace chase me all my life. Pursue me, meaning if I turn right, you turn right. If I turn left, you're already there. I can't go anywhere to escape your grace, I can try to run away, I can try to say I deny it, but none of them are effective. Your grace and your goodness and your mercy and your love for me are everywhere, and I can't get away from it. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord for how long? For ever. <laughs> right? There's another Psalm 84 that says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. And yet here we're promised that we're going to be in his courts forever, forever. That's awesome news, guys. And so as, as we talk about that and as, as you let that sink in, I want to invite to the stage our panelists. And so um, 
They'll come up here and, and we'll get some chairs, but I want you to start thinking, what questions do you have? Maybe you find yourself in the dark. Maybe you have, have been through the dark. Maybe you see the dark coming, whatever it is, and you want to, uh, to hear some stories of those who have been in it. And I'll just tell you this. There's going to be four of us up here, and we're not up here because we're the four people at Reality Church that have been through the darkness, right? Uh, my guess is that any one of you could probably be also be up here telling your story, okay? And so uh, if there's something that you want to know, if something that has been bothering you during this series, when you look out into this world that we live in, go ahead and, and ask the question, and hopefully with a little extra time today, we'll be able to get to those. And... Um, so before we do that, let me, let me sort of introduce everybody. So if, uh, if you were here during the series, you saw some story videos that we, we showed before each sermon. And so uh, we, had, we started off with Wyatt's. Wyatt is on staff here. He's our worship pastor here. And Wyatt's video um, was about him going through the loss of his younger brother just a few years ago and how that you know, naturally affected him and how it affected his family and, and all of that. And so it was a great video. And then we had uh, Kathy's was next, I believe. And Kathy is um, a, uh, the wife of a staff member here at Reality Church. And your story was about how early on in life, around teenage years, you sort of went into depression and, and, and darkness. And, and that led actually into adulthood, being married mother of a new child, some postpartum depression, things like that. And then um, uh, the last week we showed Daniil's story, and uh, I'll, I'll say this again because this is a live uh, feed. Daniil's story was where she was in a, a relationship um, that was uh, abusive, and she needed to get out of that relationship. And so uh, she will do her best to answer any questions during the service, but by all means, if you have a specific question for her, she is willing to answer that. Just come find her uh, afterwards, maybe over there in that corner. That'd yes, be, that'd seriously, be good. please. So, so Wyatt, Daniil, and Kathy. And so uh, if you have a specific question, just say for Kathy and ask it, or just a general one, just leave it open. Let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to read them, by the way, not because they can't read, but because, like, Kathy, my big head is in her way. She can't see it anyway, and just to make it easy. So uh, if you hadn't gone through your particular dark moment in life, how do you think your life would be different today? Have you seen more good come of it than evil? I think this is one that maybe all three of you can, can, can take a stab at it if you want. And so uh, basically just, yeah, great question. I'll go for it. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that I would be who I am today if I hadn't gone through my situation. I don't think I would be the same type of mom I am, the same type of wife I am now, the same type of daughter, just person in general. Um, and, you know, like a lot of times in abusive relationships, some people go one way, some people go the other way, and I, I think I went the positive way and it really I don't know it just really shaped who I am today and I think I'm a pretty all right person so awesome thank you <laughs> anybody else yeah um I mean it's it's hard to think in the moment when you're in the dark to be like you know good is going to come from this because it, it almost feels irreverent to think that but you know, my family and I have found so much, so much depth through what we've gone through. Um, there's, you know, I, me and my brother, who were always, my other brother, who were always, there was always tension there. We, we are now really, really good friends. Mm. Um, and there, it, it's amazing how God uses these situations for, you know, his glory and for, for the betterment of our lives, for a, de for a depth that we wouldn't know. Um, without these dark times. But yeah, I mean, he definitely did use it for his glory and for mm. the betterment of my life. That's great. Anything to add, Kathy? Um, I think there's definitely more joy in my life than 
I have probably remembered there being. Um, it did start at kind of a young age, so it's hard to say for sure um, how my life would have been different. But um, even in the past few years, one thing that's changed is I'm, I'm a nurse, so I had never seen myself wanting to do anything with women's health. But after Ruby was born and the postpartum depression, um, I actually just took a new job in postpartum care. So that's definitely something that's different because I, I never would have chosen that, I don't think, had I not had the experience that I had uh, with Ruby. Yeah, so, um, so now you, you find yourself maybe being one of the better equipped people in that because you, you've had that personal experience. So that's great. Great, great question, by the way. Anyone, uh, this is for anybody, I wrestle with anger towards God for being willing to forgive and allow people who do ugly and evil into heaven. How is that fair? Where is justice in that? Is this wrong? You got your money's worth on that one. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start with this one. Uh, I, too, wrestle uh, with people and the fact that there are people who do really ugly things. Um, I, w I would say this, though. The part where you talk about God allowing people into heaven, um, it's a great question. But I think we need to remember that it's God's will that every person come to a knowledge of the truth. And uh, I believe in Timothy it says that. And what, what truth is that there is one God and that one mediator, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. That's God's will that every person in this room and that every person in the world would come to that truth. Now, we also know from Scripture that that's not necessarily going to happen, that there will be people who walk away. But it's not... God is not letting people, and I use letting in quotes, God is not letting people into heaven based on good deeds and bad deeds. Um, if he were, I've got bad news for all of us. Am I right? I mean, we're, none of us are getting in. He's, he's allowing people into heaven based on one thing, and that's faith in his son, Christ Jesus. Uh, that's what we believe. And so it's not an issue of good people or bad people getting into heaven. It's an issue of forgiven people getting into heaven. And, and we can't take that promise away from anyone because God made that promise. If you are forgiven, then, then heaven is your, your destination. Now, all that said, is there still ugliness and evil and, and injustice and all that? Man, right? I mean... Just look at the past week. I think we all would agree that definitely there is ugliness and evil. And again, this, this, we would need a whole sermon or two to maybe answer this, this one. But um, a lot of people say, well, why can't God just create a place that's free of all this dirtiness and evil and guilt and all this stuff? Well, he did th originally. Did he not? And, and we messed it up. As humanity, we messed it up. And so we live in a fallen world. And because of the, co the consequences of sin, not only do we struggle with sin, we have to struggle with other people's sin. And um, so I would agree with your question that that is something that, that should give you turmoil because... The only reason you know that that is wrong is because you have the image of God written on your heart, and it says that that is wrong. Otherwise, uh, you, you would have no basis to say that that is wrong. For example, an atheist who does not even believe that God exists has no basis to claim for injustice. Why, why could you? Because you don't claim that there is justice coming from anywhere. So, uh, so yeah, that is a difficult question to answer but an honest one, and uh, one that I think we, in times like this especially, we all have to struggle with. I don't know how you guys, 
have anything to add to that or not, they just threw another one on there. So I guess they want us to move on. <laughs> Do you still feel like you are in the dark? I just don't think I will ever not be out of the dark. I relate mostly to Kathy. Well, um, I will start off by saying it has actually been, I, I do find myself in the dark still. Um, you know, depression isn't something that is ever going to go away. Um, you know, it's a chronic health issue in some ways. Um, this year has actually been really hard for me personally. Um, it's just, I mean, really, it's just been a dark year. Um, it started off really you know, it was really dark, as in there was no sunshine. So for some reason, that really affected me. Um, and I just kept thinking, okay, okay, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. And um, it just didn't. You know, I, it's just, I don't know how to describe it other than to say, you know, I have good days and I have bad days. And this year has been more bad days than good days. And even I think in all of that, I still, I'm able to remember the good days that I have and, and look forward to them because, you know, some days that's all you have. <laughs> and, um, you know, through it all, like I said in my video, God has been faithful and, um, you know, some days that is all I have to cling to. But, um, yeah, I think that's a real, that's a real question. You know, will you ever get out of the dark? The answer is yes. You know, you will, you will have good days. And um, you know, like Danielle, if you want to talk more about it with me, I'll be over in the corner too. So, um, you know, it's a fight. Every day I have to wake up and decide, am I going to fight today? And, um, and I do, <laughs> you know, and, and some days it's, I see the benefit of that and some days I don't, but I still choose to fight. So I hope that helps. Yeah. One of the things that's encouraging to me is to read through the Psalms. And when you read through them, you see, um, man, these guys who wrote this, primarily David, he was schizophrenic sometimes. Because, and, and I say that humorously, meaning he would, he would cry out, God, you're horrible. My life is horrible. And then like immediately, you're awesome. And, and then from one Psalm to the next, it could be like, the darkest thing you've ever read to something that we would sing on the Christian radio as praise and worship. And you're like, how is that possible to, to be so down and so up? And, and I think when you go through life, like the psalmist did, you realize that it's not one point that you, that you stop experiencing something and your life is now good. It's something that's going to be recurring maybe different things that are going to come, different seasons of your life. And um, that, that, in a weird way, that's an encouragement to me um, that I'm not alone and Kathy's not alone when we go through those things either multiple times or multiple different events. So, I've been abused too. How do you let someone in again? What was the process you took for healing? I'm going to let you answer this one. Well, um, it took, it took a while and I had some, you know, some relationships that didn't work out in between my ex-husband and I'm, I am now happily married again. Um, but I mean, there was failed relationships in there as well. Um, and I guess I'm still healing, like there's things that you know that are still inside that that come out every once in a while um but it's not necessarily a bad thing because like i said earlier i, I wouldn't be who i am today if i didn't go through what i went through and um and having having a good man by your side is is very helpful um he helps me through things that i might be struggling with and um, and a lot of prayer <laughs> and um, for those of you that saw my video, you know I, I had to I had to start with forgiveness um, 
I had to forgive myself. I had to forgive God. I had to forgive him. And it was a process, and it's still something that, that I continue to go through, but, but I'm, I'm good now. It's, it's a process, though. Yeah, it's an interesting, um, the, the question is interesting in that it assumes it's a process of healing, and, and you would agree with that, that it's yes. definitely a process. And it doesn't just happen It's not happen an overnight, overnight thing. No, I didn't just wake up one day and I was like, oh, I'm fine now. Yeah. That's, that's not how it went. Um, and, you know, some days, like, it's like, man, that happened to me. Like, that's crazy. That happened to me. But it's more of like a, a distant memory now, I guess, because I'm, I'm really happy now. I have, you know, I have a good husband. I have three really awesome kids, and it's okay. Life's good. Yeah. It happens. Come talk to me. <laughs> it happens. I'm guessing a very understanding and yes. gracious husband at times. I mean, he would have to be, because anyone that knows me... <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm awesome. <laughs> you are awesome. Uh, Wyatt, how is your family doing? They're good. Um, I mean, it's, it's like you guys have said, it's been a process. Um, and any time of dark in your life, it, it seems like it's always a process. But, you know, the first week of the dark, my dad came. Um, my, my whole family came. And, you know, he had a job again, and the, when my brother passed, he, it was at my dad's work site, um, and I mean, it was sort of going under. It had been for a while, and so they decided to sell the company after that because they couldn't go to work um, there every day and see where it had happened, and it was just too much. Um, but like we said earlier, it's it's just amazing to see how God uses that for his glory, and my family is amazing, and yeah, it's it's great. Um, if, I, if I can add on to that question, it, is everyone on a similar journey, or are they, are they at different points along that journey? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... We're all at different points, but we're all kind of together with it. Um, you know, at first it was really hard to, to say my brother's name or to, to look at his face, and it was the same way for everybody else in my family. Um, and so we're all kind of, we all kind of got over that, and then it was on to a new problem, and a new problem. And we're all kind of on the same journey, but I mean, I think everybody in the family would tell the story differently. Mm. Um, and. And it's still hard to even talk about it as a family. It's kind of awkward, you know. It's, it's, it's hard to ask the difficult questions. And I'm sure you guys have felt that before sometime, you know. Like, even here in church, it's hard to, like, go up to somebody and say, hey, how are things, when, it's, when you know they're not good. Um, but it's what's necessary, so. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks for that. Uh, for anyone again, how have these things affected your marriage? Do you have open communication with your spouse about your struggles? Great question. I'll take the lead. Um, so I actually had not really talked about a lot of things um, from my past. Not that I was hiding them, but I, I just didn't like talking about them. Like, like you said, it, it's uncomfortable to talk about certain things. and. Um, and it actually wasn't until re-engage that I opened up a little bit more because my husband and I went to re-engage. And, um, and like, I, I don't know, we just kind of learned, like, it's okay to talk about, you know, these things. And, and so I think that was good. And I, I mean, he's very supportive and understanding. And, um, and so I think that, I, I, yes, now it's more open, I guess. Well, not that it was ever closed, but... I'm more open to talking about it and like doing this is totally out of my comfort zone and <laughs> I really can't even believe I'm sitting here talking. But, um, but I think it's good because like just telling my story, I'd never really done that before and just opening up and 
letting it all out was like this freeing thing for me. And it, it was kind of the same way in our marriage. Once I was able to feel like I could talk about it a little bit more, it, it helped. It helped a lot. So mm. I would say, I would say that what it affected, I, I mean, I, I guess I, don't, I didn't really answer that, but kind of. But I don't think it necessarily affected our marriage. But now that I've opened up a little bit more about it, maybe it's helped. I don't know what I'm trying the to say. Communication. Maybe, maybe. Okay. I guess so. Take it away. Well, don't, don't hurt yourself. Okay? I don't, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to stop. <laughs> uh, what about you guys? Anything to add to that? Um. If anybody knows my husband, Nathan, you know that I married a saint, which, <laughs> yeah, well. which is great because, <laughs> because, you know, depression affects everyone a little differently, I think, but one of the main ways that I know that I'm kind of headed into it is I, I get angry and I get bitter and, you know, nobody can do anything right <laughs> um, in my eyes. Um, and so there've definitely been a lot of really bad fights, um, but there has also been a lot of really good, honest communication. Not always, um, I'm really good at, at closing up, um, but Nathan is <laughs> very good at making me talk. <laughs> and so it's, it's good in that sense, um, but it's hard. You know, marriage is hard to begin with, and then, you know, kind of throw this, this craziness on top of it, and, um, you know, there have been some really hard times, but um, we, we work hard, and we work together, and I think that's, that's the important thing, and um, he's very supportive and um, just knows when I need extra help or attention and knows kind of when to back off a little too so um you know we get a little better at it each day but you know it's it's good overall i'd say it's good good thank you good any uh, any other questions or are we going home early how did you reconnect or connect with your faith after or during the dark it's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, for me, it, I was in Bible college when it happened. Um, and it was mostly, you know, as it's, it's kind of that lament that helped me get through the hard times, you know, the bringing your problem before God and just being honest and saying, God, I'm, I can't do this alone. Um, and that dependency really helped me through it all. I mean, um, the dependency on God and the dependency on others around me, you know, just saying, hey, guys, this is really awkward for me because, you know, it's intimacy, I guess, and that's just not my forte, but it, it's, it's just saying, hey, guys, I can't do this alone, and mm. I really need your help. And I you'll be surprised how little people will be like, eh, no. <laughs> yeah. So most people are willing to, to be a community for you and to help you. In that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Strangers are. I mean, it's, it's amazing when you put your faith in other people. Hmm. It's a great plug for life groups. <laughs> Thank you for that, Wyatt. Yeah. Uh, ladies, any, anything there? I, uh, I, I love this question because it also speaks against this perception that a lot of people have that if you are a Christian, you believe in Jesus, all of this, right? You go to church, you do the right things, that somehow your life because of that is supposed to be problem free. And um, I think the only people who believe that are not in church following God. Because if you are, you know that that's not true. That just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't mean your life is problem-free. In, in fact, if anything, uh, the problems are accentuated in, in many ways. And so I love, I love the, the question because it assumes that only 
um, ungodly people go through the dark because that is so not true. Uh, that, that's one of the things the darkness does is it doesn't discriminate against anyone's faith uh, system. Everyone goes through the dark and problems of, of suffering and, and so forth. So, But I love what you said about um, inviting people into that because maybe, maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're, you feel like you're in the dark, but you don't feel like, what, what is my next step, or how can I get out, or what can I do? And I would just encourage you, like, like Wyatt did, and I know the, the two ladies did also, they included other people around them in the process. Um, someone asked this question last service. That's how I know that. And so they, they would say the same thing, that that's really uh, kind of the, the only way that they were able to to get through that. Do we have anything else or you have something? Oh, there is there. How do you respond to people? You, it's an awkward point there. Like, <laughs> how do you respond to people you tell, who tell you to just cheer up type, uh, type stuff when depressed? They don't get it. Okay, so I think when, when people would come to you maybe and say, hey, just stop being depressed or just you know get out of that situation or why you know you know god needed another angel or something stupid like that that people say like how do you deal with with that in those moments well um i think you i would love to you know like i i would love to just cheer up um you know, something that I that comes to mind is, would you tell someone with diabetes to just fix their pancreas? You know, like, you, you can't. <laughs> you know, my brain Spoken is... Spoken <laughs> like a true nurse. <laughs> my brain is messed up. You know, I have, I have an actual chronic disease. And, you know, it does sadly get treated different than a physical ailment that, you know, has f- fixable symptoms. And... Um, you know, I, my brain just doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to all the time. And, um, you know, I think when you explain it somewhat like that, you know, just say, hey, this isn't something I can just snap my fingers and it's better. You know, I, it doesn't just, you know, turn on a dime. I can't just say, oh, well, I want to feel better now, so I will. Mm. Um, it just, it doesn't work that way. So I think when you're honest, with people and you you just tell them you kind of explain how how it really works then then i think they they do get it a little bit better i i think it's hard for people to understand who haven't been there um so sometimes it it may take some time but um you know i think when you do invite people into your life and and allow them to help you with the healing process then then they start to understand a little better too. So that's great. Yeah, and kind of like, you know, you said just get out. Like <clears throat> that's kind of the same. It's not that easy. There's so many things that go into each of, you know, everyone's individual situation that it's not it's not just that easy. You know, I couldn't just walk out the door like that. I mean, maybe I could. I don't know. I could. It's just it's not it's not how it works. So and it's nice to have a support system, friends and family that understand. Hmm. That's good. Anything to add? No. No. <laughs> Great job. I've heard people say everyone could use some form of counseling. Would you agree with this? Have each of you had counseling pertaining to your struggles? Um, I mean, it's always nice to have someone to talk to, even yeah. if it's just for that. Just having someone that maybe doesn't know your whole life story and just to have, you know, them to bounce ideas off of or talk to about things that maybe you, you know, can't talk to anyone else about. I mean, I, I didn't, but, I mean, I probably could have. Maybe it would have help me open up about my situation before now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I think it, I think that would 
be a great option. I would just change the word counseling to support. Mm. I mean, counseling is great. Um, big fan of it, but I, I haven't personally gone through any counseling. But just having people support is is always great. People to ask the hard questions and feel awkward as you try to, you know, emotionally respond. But yeah. Anything to add? Sure. Um, I actually I have done some um, professional counseling. And um, I found it to be incredibly helpful. Um, it was nice to just have someone who um, really had no stock in my situation just kind of sit back and, and listen to me talk about what was going on and then you know, kind of be able to dissect it a little bit and be like, okay, this is what you're telling me. And you know, you're doing this really well. So you know, keep doing that and use that to your benefit. And you know, here are some things maybe you should like, maybe not do so much. Um, you know, and I think just having more tools and, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a professional setting. You can, I mean, I've got some amazing friends that, I mean, I would consider talking to them like a counseling session because, you know, they're able to just be honest with me and kind of tell me what they see and, um, you know, they pray for me and encourage me. And, I mean, ultimately, I think that's what it comes down to is, um, I mean, I think they would agree just not doing life by yourself. Um, it's really easy to do, um, to try to do life by yourself in these situations because you feel so isolated. But, um, you know, just, just doing life with other people, I think, is huge. Let me just close by saying two things about that. Num number one, you know, God has gifted some people, even in this room, with the spiritual gift of wisdom and discernment. And there is so much wisdom in in here, right, that, that we would be foolish not to turn to fellow believers and friends. Uh, but I will say this also, there are times when we would recommend that going to see a professional counselor is a good move for you. And we actually have on, on our website, if you go to reality.church slash the dark, we have some resources for you. But in, in those resources, we have some, uh, some counselors and some therapists that we recommend. There are many more out there in, in the Omaha area that are great. But we, just, we have a few that you know, we, we wanted to put up there. So if that's maybe your next step and you're not sure where to go, you can check that out. Um, but yes, yeah, so let, let's, uh, let's give these guys just a, a round of applause for being up here and being honest. So we're going to wrap up this uh, service and also the series in, in kind of a fun way. It's something we, we've never done this time of year. We're going to have a candle lighting service, okay? So this is going to get you in the mood for Christmas. I'm just letting you know, all right? So at the end of each aisle, uh, there are some bags. Just reach in there and, and pass those candles out down the, the aisles, if you would, please. There's going to be some people coming by to help you get those lit. And, and that's really want, what we want you to take away from this is that if you are in the dark, you have an option. You have an option to stay there alone or you have an option to reach out. You can reach out and include someone or a group of someones. And we want you to shine a light on your darkness. Of course, we believe as Christians that that light is Jesus Christ. But we want you to just take that first step of shining the light onto your darkness. And let me read something for you real quick. This is from Psalm 139. And it says this, rem remembering that God is with us during these times. It says, is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you are there. If I go underground, you are there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute because you're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark for you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. Guys, let's pray. Father, we, 
we admit to you that there are times, maybe even now, that we are clueless, that we are hurting, that we need you. And we, we claim what this psalm says is that darkness is not dark to you. Everywhere you go, you are light. You bring light into every situation because you are light. And so we ask you not only into our hearts and our lives that you bring light, but we pray that into, these, into this darkness that, that we're going through, whatever it is, I pray that you, sh you shine a light on it. Help us include others who can help keep that in the light. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.